Welcome into another edition of Brazil Bound, presented by Castrol GTX High Mileage. The U.S. with a 2-1 to one victory over Ghana in their first match of the World Cup. And what a phenomenal day of action it was with former assistant coach of the U.S. men's national team, Jesse Marsh, Simon Borg. I'm Jason Seguini. Jason, you're a little hoarse there? My voice is, yeah. <laughs> is somewhere else out there by the television screen. We'll also be joined by Greg Lawless here in the studio. Over a lot here. to talk about uh, with this game, guys. And I mean, first off, a tremendous result for the U.S., especially when you kind of look at the game as a whole. There were some dicey moments, but Jesse, they get out of it with three points. Fantastic result, okay? Really, for me, that's all that matters. Three points. We're now poised to do well in this group, and I think we should now be thinking about how to transition out of this and already start thinking about game two. But for me, we're going we're gonna to dissect this a lot more as we go into this show. But in the end, it doesn't matter. And that's, I think, going to be one of the lessons is three points is three points, and moving on is moving on. I agree. Brave performance by the U.S. A lot of guts in that performance. Uh, scoring the early goal, then having to sit back and just suffer. And Michael Bradley and Jurgen Klinsmann warned us before the World Cup it was going to be a World Cup of suffering. And it happened, and then the injuries, and we'll get into those that happened. And the U.S. just basically suffered and battled and battled. Some guys didn't have great performances. As a whole, the team didn't perform beautifully. But the experience I think a lot of people have watching that game, that felt good. You had the early goal. You had suffering in the defending sure. of that result. Then you get the winner at the end. So it feels good. And it was a brave result. Physically, they exerted themselves Performance-wise, though, it left a lot to be desired. And it was 90 minutes, 90 minutes that felt like about five hours. Right. Yeah. It was 100 minutes when yeah. you add on the 10 yeah. minutes 10 of minutes. stoppage yeah. time, five in both halves. And we'll talk a little bit about that because injuries were a big part of this game. The U.S. got off to that one, that great start, Clint Dempsey scoring the yeah. first minute. At, by the 20th minute, you have Josie Altidore lying on the ground, pulled up with a hamstring injury, and Aaron Johansson subbing in. Halftime, you had Matt Beasler subbing in. Yes. The hamstrings, all game, you saw Bedoya, you saw Cameron, guys reaching over, stretching for good portions. It was odd muscle to issues. see yeah. this many muscle issues well, for in sure. this game. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I thought the same thing, and I actually made a phone call to France, to Pierre Berriou, who was the – strength and fitness coach for the U.S. national team for the 2002, 2006, and 2010 World Cups. And there's no doubt he did a fantastic job preparing, preparing the team to play, and we were one of the fittest teams in the tournament. And his comment to me that was that, first of all, he does not believe in coincidences, right. and that the fact that two of the hamstring pulls were in the first half meant that fatigue wasn't part of the equation. Right. Right. So... He said for sure they should investigate why this is happening. They need to look in their training regimen and everything that's going on to make sure that now they can be on top of this so that we don't have more problems like this when we go to Manus and we go other places where it's going to be humid, hot, and wet fields. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it has to be a concern. We'll talk a little bit about what happens in the next game. But let's look at this game because – it was interesting. When the U.S. came out and they scored in the first minute, you thought, wow, this is, this is it. The U.S. came to play. But right after that, from maybe the second minute on, it was all Ghana. And you look at the possession stats, 61% to 39%, 21 shots to 8 shots. This was all Ghana all the time. It was all Ghana all the time, guys? Hey. Hey, everyone. How's it going, by the way? Yeah. Uh, so, Greg Lawless, everybody. Yeah, it was all gone all the time. But I think what you mentioned there, Jason, about scoring that early goal, I don't think that the U.S. national team was actually prepared for scoring an early goal like that. And so there was all of a sudden almost like a panic. Like They hadn't really trained of what do we do if we score that first goal. And I think that that ends up playing. We'll talk about it tactically a little bit and how that changed stuff. But I think that plays into then dropping back, allowing all of that possession, all of those shots that ended up coming their way. Well, We've all played in games where you score early goals, and what it means is that the other team now has to push the game a little bit, and the, the team that's ahead doesn't need to. They can sit back and have a little bit, little bit more of a defensive posture. But for me, it got exaggerated way too much, and the U.S. just got pushed deeper and deeper and deeper. And 
we never were really able to find the game. The fact that the U.S. fell deep, that's, that's natural. It happens after goals. The issue you have to point at is that the U.S. couldn't muster any possession. That's a big issue. And when I look at it, the possession game for the U.S. depends so much on Michael Bradley. And Michael Bradley, you know him better than any of us here, he didn't have one of his, one of no, his trademark wasn't his best games. Game. I think you can come out and say this was probably the worst game I've seen Michael Bradley play in a long time. And look, he's still a top-level player, but he was missing passes that you normally see. He, he has the ideas, and the execution just wasn't there. And I wonder if that goes back to his legs not being there for whatever reason, the same way the other guys were having issues. Yeah, the only I mean, I thought defensively he actually did a very good job, and we'll talk about how they tilted him a little bit differently and used him differently as the game went on. Mm -hmm. So I thought that he helped do the job there, but he wasn't as clean and didn't make – you know, you're going to miss some passes in the game, but I did think he missed too many of the easy passes that normally you don't see him miss. To his credit, I thought that one play in the first half, he had a pure low-esque dummy to Aaron Johansson cutting into the box, and Johansson pulled up his run like he didn't see it coming, and I was like, that was it right there. That was the play. But the issue for the U.S. need Michael Bradley to play at a high level, both defensively and, and linking up the forwards. I mean, the forwards, and Aaron Johansson came on for Alt Altidore, the forwards were absent because there was no one to link them up, and that's Bradley's job. He wasn't there for it. And, and partly now, once they start defending more and more and more and putting more energy into that, you have less energy to play with the ball. Fair enough. Guys, uh, before we get over to the big board and look at some of the tactical things that we saw in this game, I want to remind everyone, you can tweet at us. Tweet at MLS. Use the hashtag BrazilBound. We'll get your questions and comments into the show. And uh, we have a couple that have come in already. I have them on this magic piece of paper here. Uh, I'll do one from at Beast KSI fan. Uh, he says, who was your standout player in this match? And I'll go around the horn here uh, to get the standout player from each guy. Simon, who did you I'd take? be shocked if we didn't agree it was Jermaine Jones. Just because yeah. of the work he did on both sides of the ball. He wasn't the cleanest as well, but it was so important for him to be that guy up and down the left flank because that's all Ghana were going. They were going down that left flank, and he did the job. Yeah, that's what I said to Jesse uh, at the end of the game. Mine is Aaron Brooks. OK, to to now come in at a halftime and play John center Anthony back. Brooks. Sorry, John. What did I say? Who's Aaron, Aaron Brooks. Brooks? Sorry, I don't know. John Anthony. Brooks. <laughs> Football <player? laughs> Football. John, John Anthony Brooks came in at a halftime watching that game on the bench and now coming in as a center back, yeah. knowing that most likely for 45 minutes you are going to be under the gun. He had a very shaky play, yeah. maybe his first one of the half. Yeah. And then from there on in, very solid cut out crosses. Good in the air, game-winning goal. Simon, you said in our pregame show you would start him. He ends up getting 45 minutes, plays very well. Greg, who did you like in this match? Uh, you know what? It's uh, for me. I think Beckerman did a good job just sitting in the yeah. middle. You know, he was he was Kyle just, Beckerman fan club here. Well, yeah, there seemed to be here, but I think that he just sat in the middle. Look, he he didn't. We didn't really notice him, and mm. that's kind of you're, Jesse. You were a defensive midfielder. That's what you want in your defensive midfield. You don't want no to notice your defensive midfielder too much. I agree with Simon, though, that Jermaine Jones was phenomenal in this game. He was all over the place, and his athleticism against the Ghanaians was really paramount for the success for the U.S. All right, Jesse, I'm going to let you head over to Greg. We have a couple more questions that right. are geared more towards the next game. We're going to get to looking ahead to Portugal a little bit later in the show. But you guys talk about what happened, especially after the Altidore injury, when the U.S. decided to shift tactics, which worked to some extent. It obviously didn't get them a ton of possession, but they, uh, they certainly were able to to keep Ghana off the board for a while. All right, well, let, let's start first by just showing a little bit of the formations of how the U.S. and Ghana came out to begin with. Uh, and, Jesse, we saw sort of the 4-3-2-1 the Christmas tree. That You hate that term, but we, that's the way the U.S. came out in the beginning. Yep. Sort of a 4-4-2 from Ghana to start, which was a little bit of a surprise for us. We were expecting more of a 4-1-4-1. Walk us through the decision-making maybe on Ghana's side and, of course, the U.S. Well, starting with Ghana, they made a couple of personnel changes that we didn't predict. The Essien didn't start. They wound up going with Atsu, and I, I thought Atsu had actually a fantastic game, okay, number seven, coming down the wing a lot, and we'll talk about that next. Uh, but they still had the same sort of approach, which was the guys in the back are dedicated toward defending, and the attacking players are dedicated toward attacking. This game played out where... The whole team wound up doing a lot more attacking than anything else. Right. But that still was a lot of their philosophy. 
Then we talked about the 4-3-2-1, and we talked about strengths and weaknesses. Strengths were that we took care of the middle of the field, and it was hard for them to now make any interior passes or combinations, and definitely it was hard for them to find John. Okay, so that was a very, a, very a, a positive for sure. But the biggest issue was that too often they were able to make one pass, mostly to Atsu, and get him 50 yards down the field around our 18, where now he could start going at Beasley, creating little one-on-ones, getting crosses in, finding John at different moments. So that wound up being the biggest problem for the U.S. tactically. When Altidore got hurt, so let's sub in Johansson, right? They made a tactical adjustment, and you could see Johansson come in the field and now start talking to guys. And essentially what they tried to do was move Bedoya and Jones a little bit wider, drop Bradley a little bit deeper, and now play more of a standard 4-4-2. Let me ask this, though. You say that they did that as if it was determined by the coach that they would do this. Was this, do you think, a tactical decision by the coaching staff? Or was this more of that pressure is happening and Bradley just sort of naturally dropping a little bit? No, for me, I think it was pretty obvious to everyone on the bench that they were getting killed on the wings. Right. And that, more than anything, they were just giving up field position. Like, yeah. it was way too easy to just now pass the ball right down there and now have them go at us. And now our whole block of eight, block of seven, whatever, was forced back on top of our own 18. Well, I remember we also talked in the preview about the idea of not having them defend here, but having the back line defending here. How did that play out? We talked about that with uh, possession and position on the field. Yeah, well, actually, we wound up defending more like here, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and again, that is the result of being of Ghana having possession, mm -hmm. of being able to get at us from the wings, trying to keep it compact. But this is the way games go. So when Jurgen Klinsmann talks about proactive soccer so much, yes, when we play in CONCACAF, when we play certain opponents, we can pass the ball and we can dictate because our players are better and smarter and more athletic. But the reality is now, when you go to the World Cup and you play against the best competition, in a lot of ways, we're in our, over our heads. So the reality is, you, Jurgen Klinsmann didn't go into this game and say, we're going to defend only on top of our own 12-yard bot or 12 penalty spot, 18. But you just get pushed back, and you get pushed back. So for that reason alone, I'm trying to say here in this, in this now studio, proactive soccer. <laughs> it's out the window. It's about winning. Yeah. Winning soccer, okay? Right. Great goal we scored, and maybe it's a result of scoring an early goal and we're on our heels a lot, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We get the lead. Let's defend the lead. Let's compete. Let's deal with moments, and we did, and we won. It was pretty classic American soccer. Yes, and then, defend, and set piece. Set piece. Thank you very right much. Right on. Simon, what do you got? I know that defending that deep is maybe looked down upon a little bit, but I would say that the game transpiring the way it did actually helped because it nullified Ghana's weapons, in my opinion. Because now, Asamoah John had no, nowhere to make a run. Uh, Andre Ayew had nowhere to make a run. Andre Ayew was, was missing in action. And so, in a way, I think it helped the U.S. And to totally. be honest, defensively, they were pretty organized, pretty orderly. There were clearances that were happening. But at no point, really, were you worried until they got the equalizer. Then, at that point, you're worried, okay... They're, the second goal There's is coming. definitely some desperate moments, but for the most part, guys weren't panicking. Right. You know, it wasn't total chaos. There seemed to be a sense on the field to how to deal with different moments. You know, you've got a good when you have a good goalie in those moments, gives so many of the guys on the field a lot of confidence. So I think that knowing that they got Tim Howard back there to help clean up messes really helps out too. And he did do he did do well for himself in the game when he was called upon. Uh, I want to ask another question that came in uh, from the fans. This is from Joseph on YouTube. He says, uh, I was surprised at how physical the match was. I mean, we saw Clint Dempsey yeah. look like he popped his nose open. We saw a lot of injuries, a lot of tough tackles. Uh, when you get kicked in the nose, it basically pops. Um, so he says, what were your thoughts on that? Did, were you surprised to see it as physical as it was? Me, no. I mean, this is still a cornerstone of who we are and what we bring to games. And then, again, when you look at Ghana's physicality, mm -hmm. athleticism, strength that they bring into the game, you know, this is, this is still a blueprint for success. And, it ha again, 
This has been the blueprint for success for more than three years. Mm -hmm. This has been the blueprint for success for 12 years. Okay, and so, but yeah, we make sure as Americans. Four years. Yeah, you go okay. back to 1990. You can go back further. <laughs> That's fine. But it's about bringing and competing and like having guys on the field that aren't, aren't going to shy away from moments. And that was definitely an American performance. Why, why are we taking now this game and trying to make it and trying to create this identity of the U.S. team? Because I think that we all would agree. That's great, the competitiveness, but we hope that U.S. soccer emerges from that, that U.S. soccer does not become that, that U.S. soccer goes the route that Klinsman is envisioning. So I appreciate that everyone is now rah-rah, that's the American way, but Simon, that's not the way forward. But Let's Simon, agree on that. But Simon, the U.S. game and style of playing that is successful and has proven successful over the last two and a half decades in particular is actually more similar to the styles that we're seeing being successful in the World Cup right now, which is that sit back, counter attack, you move on transition. That's where the U.S. is good. And that's where a lot of the teams that are succeeding right now are good. Is the U.S. going to play like Spain in, in 2010? No, they're not. Should they even be trying to? Maybe not. What if you perfect the style? Not against the Netherlands. Forget about Spain. How about Germany? Everyone brings up Spain. Play like Germany, where you, you can make runs and you're good enough to keep possession and threaten the teams that have thing, enough, the, enough technical players the, that can make but plays. But the possession thing, you're absolutely right. That is, a, is something to be brought up and discussed. In this game in particular, and one thing you guys didn't talk about, which is I think the possession actually flipped when Altidore went off. All of a sudden, you didn't have a good outlet up, up top. Johansson is not that type of player. And Altidore, we always talk about him. He may not score goals, but he does a lot of those little things, holding off defenders, holding on to the ball, and we were never able to get out because of that. On, on that topic, let me ask you this. I think, Simon, you're yeah. going to go to the same place. Jesse, when Altidore got hurt, put your coach's hat on. You're on the sideline. Is that the same decision that you would make? Are you looking at Aaron Johansson? Are you looking at Chris Wondolowski? Are you maybe looking at shifting Clint Dempsey up there? What, what were your thoughts when that happened? The only thing that I was thinking is, is it potentially a moment where you could shift more to a 4-3-3? All right, and maybe move Bradley even a little bit deeper and play now Bedoya on one wing, Dempsey up top by himself, and bring in a guy like Zussi on the other side and see if you can help take care of the wings that way. So you could call it a 4-5-1, a 4-3-3, whatever. So, mm -hmm. But if he wanted to, to now shift to a 4-4-2, I do think Johansson is the piece to bring on the field. And he never really found the game, but it, it, was, it was partly the result of how the game was being played. Do you feel that he could have done anything differently? Though, uh, Johansson, I feel like he didn't come back and come into the midfield enough to help. I, I thought he was, he almost went away from the play, he shied away from the game a little bit. I, I don't agree with that. I just think that his moments to now be to now really be a part of the play were, were, were few and far between based on the fact that we spent so much time defending. I mean, maybe he could have made uh, he had one moment where early on he got a ball in the wing and maybe he could have cleanly gotten out of that space a little bit easier and connected a little bit better. He had a shot at the top of the box. I mean, still as a forward, those are the plays that you can he make a little bit of a difference in the attacking part of the field, but. But that's the only thing for me is tactically could it have been, especially because you were so vulnerable on the wings, mm -hmm. could you have switched to a 4-3-3 or was 4-4-2 the best thing to do? The one word that I was describing Johansson's performance with was non-committal. It was almost like he, he wouldn't go 100% in no. any direction. He was, he was caught between two minds over and over. And maybe you're right. He wasn't caught up to the speed of the game, and it was maybe a little bit better on the back half. I want to ask you a couple more questions, and we're going to move on and look ahead towards Portugal. This one is interesting because Michael Bradley is not a question. There's never a question of Michael Bradley in the lineup, but Real Talk BDM on Twitter uh, asks, considering Bradley's poor performance, do you think Klinsman will potentially line him up elsewhere in the next game or in future games? And I... I assume that just means deeper in the midfield or potentially on a three-man you know, defensive midfield in a Christmas tree, dare I say it. Well, let, let me just say this. When you're, when you're the staff now okay, and you're coming out of each game, you're evaluating player performances, you're evaluating what the game looked like, and you're looking at fresh legs, injuries, the whole bit, and now trying to now come up with a game plan based on what you know the next game will be and then now put pieces in place to now ha be successful once again in the next game. So I, I already, I'm sure that already their minds are already racing and there's conversations now around the staff about what's next and how, how do we adjust now for Portugal. And you do have to ask yourself, especially given how that game went, 
are, are the next two games going to be similar? You know, and can we, can we get more possession or are we going to force to defend a little bit more? And if we're forced to defend a little bit more, then I think Michael Bradley playing a little bit deeper is very, very valuable for the team. All right, let me move on to Portugal now. The U.S.'s next game, Portugal today really got beat up against Germany. I think physically, emotionally, whatever you want to call it, yeah. Pepe getting the red card. He's out for the game against the U.S. They picked up some injuries. Looked like they went down with some hamstring injuries. So Portugal right now, you described them earlier today as a wounded animal, a wounded dog. The U.S. probably feeling good about the win. Again, maybe not about the performance. When you look at the lineup going into that game, how much of it is – don't mess with a good thing because you won. And obviously they're going to have to change Josie Altador. I don't think any of us think Altador is going to be able to go by um, Sunday. Yeah. So, so tell me, what are the changes you're making potentially to this lineup for that Portugal game? Well, first of all, I think I, I, I would question whether Beezer will be healthy either. So Aaron Brooks might stay in there. And given that he had a good performance. There he goes with the Aaron Brooks again. <laughs> not that, not that. The Packers? <laughs> Did I say Aaron Brooks yeah, again? Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> what if you John call Brooks. him John Aaron Brooks? Let's just Brooks, call him Brooks. So it's, a, it's closer. Brooks. Uh, Brooks. Uh, let, let's, uh, he, there's, you know, there's potential that he's earned his spot, I think. And mm. then, yeah, you've got to now ask yourself what, what's going to be the best lineup and tactics for this Portugal game. And I think we may see a 4-3-3. We may get back to what they look like more in qualifying. Clint up top by himself. Why don't you, why don't you go back to the board with Greg? Uh, we can see the lineup that we have there. Obviously, Josie, Josie is going to come out for this, game, for this next game. Yeah. You're going to stick with Johansson here? Well, let's, let's for now say that we bring in Zussi, okay, which is... What's, what's, let's say we bring in... Number 19. Sorry, number 19, not Guzan. Okay. That's a crazy All right. formation. And let's just say that uh, Bedoya is ready to go, that most likely Beasler will not be ready to go. And let's take a look at this a little bit as if it's a 4-3-3, okay, or 4-2-3-1. And Portugal is another team that plays with a lot of wide play. They play a version of a 4-3-3, so I think that this could potentially be a good matchup for them. And, and what it does, again, mostly is cuts down a lot of the easy plays to Cristiano Ronaldo, to, the, to guys on the wing, to, to Nani, that can now cause you a lot of problems. Yeah, and you mentioned Cristiano Ronaldo. Against Portugal, obviously, this is the side where he's going to be attacking Johnson obviously has the speed to at least stay up with him, maybe not beat him or anything like that. But Doyle, we've talked about his work rate up there. But if you're going to do that, is there maybe a question where these two have to switch and you want Jermaine Jones a little closer on this side from a help standpoint? Yeah, I mean, you, you could do that. You could do that. And, and I understand that, especially with Johnson going forward, that that might be tactically a good thing to do. But even with this lineup, I still think you can start by saying, all right, we don't want to get beat through the middle, similar to what we did last game, but that we're also really careful to balance ourselves out on the wing because we know Portugal is effective in that manner. And then you still have Bradley ahead of the ball, so you can play with him. You can use mobility in Bedoya, and, and still Jones can use his mobility to move around and make plays because you know that Beckerman will, will play an honest role in there, and, and that will, again – feed into Jones's strengths and Beckerman's strengths. And we've, you know, we've actually seen this before when these three are in the middle, guys, and you see these actually, there's almost like a rotation between Jones and Bradley sometimes in getting forward where if Jones goes back, Bradley's coming back into the, into the back this way. So you know, I think that we have seen that before, which could be useful as well. Yeah, and, and then again, another key is going to be we don't want to just spend the whole game defending in this part of the field. That's right. not going to be a recipe for success for us. Can we move our team up the field more? Can we make it harder for teams to just come right down the field on us? So that's going to be, again, something they need to address and something to look forward to. Now, Simon, you probably have a thought on this one as well, but you know, when you have Brooks and Cameron in here together in this uh, center of the defense, Portugal's a little bit different than Ghana in the way that they play. They're a little more technical. They're going to be moving the ball around a little bit more. Is this what you want to see? I, I, that's where I was going. I, I think I like that lineup also because you figure if um, Ed, Eder has to go, Eder is the forward for, um, for Portugal, uh, then he is a t taller player, good in the air. I think you'd, you'd, you'd do well having Brooks and Cameron cut out balls for him because aside from that, what other, with Hugo Almeida out, what other options do they have up top? 
Not, not many. So I think the Brooks Cameron thing works there for that reason. And then Jones and Beckerman in that spot also helps you cut out Joao Moutinho, who we all know is the passing genius. He's the inspiration for them. So to have them be able to keep an eye on Moutinho, I think, I think helps a lot. So I think this lineup actually could work. And to be fair to Brooks, he played well when he played against Turkey. Mm-hmm. He played well in this game. I, I don't see how he hasn't earned a spot right now. Okay, so regardless of what the other pieces are right now, he's had 90 minutes where he's looked very sharp and made a big difference and scored a game-winning goal in a game that meant an awful lot. Nothing like a goal to improve your confidence, that's for sure. The one thing about that lineup, though, that I think people would say is if you're only going with Dempsey up top, you've basically renounced any chance of really meaningful attacks is what the criticism will be. Well, guys, let me ask you this because... um, a lot of talk on Twitter right now, and you know our audience is, is all about him, about Chris Wondolowski. So I'm curious to get your thoughts. Does Chris Wondolowski have a role in this next game against Ghana, especially with Josie Altidore out? It may not be as a starter. It may be off the bench. But what is the role that you'd expect him to play uh, in this next match? Well, I, I, again, I think... It was potential that if there weren't so many injuries and we were behind that we could have seen Chris Wondolowski tonight. But because of the way the game played out, I don't think there was room for him in the game. But when you're looking now toward the next game and now trying to find a way to get Wando on the field, especially when you feel like the game's tied or you need a goal, he's a guy that if now we're able to start possess the ball a little bit and push the other team back and he's in and around the box because that's where he's effective. If you're asking him to make a lot of big plays in and around midfield and build up, that's not his strength. But if we're now pushing and we're now attacking and being the ones that are around our own goal. Being proactive? Okay. <laughs> that's where Wando can make a difference. Where, where would the change come if you see this coming? Well, you know, that, that's the, in those moments you can decide to potentially – Bring in, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, in that moment, you can take out Bedoya, you can shift up here, you can put Jermaine out wide, you can leave Kyle, you can take Beckerman out and leave Jones in that position. You know, so, so there's different options that you can do there. But, but Wando's definitely a guy that, again, I think if we need a goal at the end of the game, he'd be a valuable person. Well. It's going to be curious to see what the U.S. does with all those injuries having to deal with that. Let's not forget, there are the injuries on the Portuguese side and the red card to Pepe, so they're undermanned as well. Yeah, and uh, when Dempsey got kicked in the face in this game, Chris Wondolowski was the guy warming up, so you never know if something happens to Dempsey. Yep. When you look at the U.S. team after this game, yeah. I mean, again, we talked about them being beat up. They looked exhausted. Are you nervous going into Manaus, which is – basically known as the rainforest and oven. Is that going to be a factor against this Portuguese team where, you know, if you're beat up, if you're, if you're holding on to injuries, could they have to potentially make bigger changes or more changes, really bring guys off the bench who aren't beat up from this first game? Bottom line is with a game on Sunday, is that enough recovery time? As a coaching staff, are you sitting there and like, we have till Sunday, we're okay. Yeah, there is enough time theoretically. Uh, given the way the game went, some guys might be a little bit banged up there, and you know mm. we clearly saw some injuries. But the other thing for me that I looked at is I watched Portugal play Ireland here in the Meadowlands uh, last week, and they didn't look very. I mean, they killed Ireland, but it was a cool night, and they were here until three days before. They only went down three days before the game, so I, mm-hmm. I, I wondered to myself, like, is that enough time for them to acclimatize? So. This game we may actually, and given where the weather in Portugal and everything else, this game we may actually have in our favor the climate. That might be a good thing for us. So, but I do think, again, when you're now looking at the tactics and you're looking at fresh legs, and you, you've got to evaluate the full package and now try and put a team on the field. This is why the last show that we had, I said you, you have to take it game by game because you never know what each game's going to bring at you. And what, if we lost... This game would be different if we won. If we had everyone healthy, it'd be different if we didn't. Cards. So you have to really evaluate each moment in each game. All right, guys. Before we go, I just want to get your final thoughts. Germany wins big. The U.S. gets the W. They're in second place in the group, in good position moving forward. What are your thoughts right now as a whole about the U.S. performance and what we saw today from Group G? In my opinion, again, brave performance by the U.S. They're in great position. But that game against Portugal, even though they have a three-point lead over Portugal, that is the game 
to decide second place in this because Germany, they're going to finish in first. They, they were that dominant. There's no way they're, they're dropping any points the rest of the way. But this game against Portugal, I think you got to go in with the mentality. You have to win this as well. And these Portuguese side, to me, they're a little weak mentally. The way that game transpired, you could tell that it didn't react well. And it starts from Cristiano Ronaldo and his attitude on the field. So I think this, the way things have fallen, turns out to be a winnable game for the U.S. they got to go out with the right attitude. And I think the formation is going to dictate what that approach is for the U.S. Do they really believe they can go out and win? For me, the U.S. has got to be licking its chops right now. I mean, they have got to be thinking this is a grand opportunity we got to take advantage of it. We've got to regroup and now mentally go into this Portuguese game thinking we have as good a chance right now as, as anyone in the group. Yep. All right. And knowing that if they can get the kind of result that they need against Portugal, that they can set themselves up. Hopefully that Germany will take care of business to go into a third game where maybe Germany doesn't need the result. And now they can they can now they can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel and say, you know what, we can get out of this group. This is a realistic goal at this point. Greg, final thoughts? I think the last thing to think about is if you start to do some of the math around this as well, because of the way things worked out, the last thing the U.S. wants to do is lose this game. They don't want to go into the Germany game needing a result, right? So even a tie, though, given the way things are right now with the other two teams pushing for that win, a tie for the U.S. will be okay, I think, because if Germany's not giving up any points, the odds are they're going to beat Ghana in that last game, so you don't have to worry about Ghana. Then it's just about whether... Uh, Portugal can end up doing anything when they take on Ghana. And it comes down to that game in many ways. And then you I'm, trying have to goal math. Difference. I'm trying to do math. I'm not that great. Then you have to yeah. goal goal math. Portugal it losing important. Portugal losing four nothing, which means a tie for the U.S. Yeah. going into that final weekend. Would, would, good, right. All right. So feeling good right now about where the U.S. stands in the group. Obviously, there is a lot more to come. That next game Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN. I want to remind everyone, you can comment on this video. You can also tweet at us using the hashtag BrazilBound. If we use your comments on future shows, we of course will send you some Castro World Cup swag. A lot of stuff given away on this show, a lot of stuff given away through the week. Stay tuned to MLSsoccer.com all week long for plenty more coverage of the 2014 World Cup from Brazil. I want to thank Greg, Jesse, and Simon for joining me on the show. That's all we have. Stay tuned to MLSsoccer.com all week. We're going to be here. We're having a lot of fun, and we're covering the World Cup. USA, Couldn't ask for anything more. USA, 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 USA. USA.